Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are here with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. And then Moses went up into the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud, now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Hear 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. reading from the second letter of Peter. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honour and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and then led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
In 1857, Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote Aurora Lee, an epic poem tapping feminine wisdom to synthesize an understanding of the world as being wholly spiritual and natural at the same time with no disconnection between them and beautifully provocative to those who are willing to open themselves to that reality. The most famous lines of the poem may be familiar to you. She wrote, Earth's crammed with heaven, every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries and dab their natural faces unaware. That's some beautiful poetry, folks. The reference to burning bushes, of course, is to the account from earlier in Exodus when Moses turns aside from his daily chores of tending his father-in-law's sheep and climbs a nearby mountain, Mount Horeb, we think, to see a burning bush not devoured by the fire and engage, and Moses engages God's presence in and through it. He's converted in the experience. And this marks the beginning of his ministry to be a servant for God's purposes. You know the story. Cecil B. DeMille taught us the story, right? The story carries on into the story that we hear from Exodus this morning. This is now in the middle of his ministry. Years later, he's led the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt and into the desert, into the wilderness. And here, out in the wilderness, he again ascends another mountain, Mount Sinai this time, to engage God, whose glory we are told is like a devouring fire except it doesn't devour Moses. But Moses is changed by the experience, transfigured, we could say, by the glory of God that he encounters. The glory is so brilliant that his face, Moses' face, becomes dazzling white like the sun. So brilliant in its glaring is it that when he comes back down the mountain, the people can't look upon him. His his face is so bright. They say, Moses, put a veil over it so we can look upon you. And he does. And Moses leads the people through the desert for 40 years. That's the biblical way of saying a really long time. Long enough for a generation or two to turn over. That is a lifetime. But Moses ends his ministry short of the promised land. He dies on the side of another mount, Mount Nebo in Moab, looking across the river valley to the promised land, but not crossing into it. He stopped short. And the echoes of that Exodus saga are picked up in the gospel reading we hear this morning. Jesus' ministry began back in the beginning of our season of Epiphany after Epiphany with His baptism when the clouds open up and a voice from from heaven blesses Him. And the dove serves as a symbol declaring that earth is God's dwelling place, that spiritual and natural are together. And then this morning, Marking the middle of his worldly ministry, Jesus ascends the mountain, Mount Tabor this time, and is transfigured, dazzling white robes with clouds wafting past. And he has witnesses there to tell you and me about it. Peter and James and John. Only he tells them, keep quiet about it until the divine plan is fulfilled because Jesus is going back down the mountain, turning his face toward Jerusalem where he will die an ignoble death at the hands of men who dab their faces unaware 
by their actions. Father, forgive them, he says, for they know what, not what they do. We hear this story of the transfiguration on this final Sunday before Lent, which is our 40-day trek in the wilderness, in the desert. 40 days being the holy interval marking the fullness of time, the length of time it takes for us to live fully into the experience. But today, we are invited to engage the transfiguring experience presumably to prime us for the journey ahead, to help us make sense of what may come, to help us make sense of the profoundly beautiful ways that our world is holy, natural, and spiritual at the same time. Earth's crammed with heaven, folks, each common bush afire with God. Now surely we all know the joy and transformative power of our mountaintop experiences in life, right? Where the air thins and the heavens open to reveal beauty to us that takes our breath away. Endorphins surge and course in our veins and stimulate our hearts and our brains with a moving sense of the holy in the moment, and we have a lightness of being that emanates as a message to others that we have been to the mountaintop and our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. But then we must descend. We must go down the mountain, back into the valleys of life, not knowing what the world here may hold for us except we need not think we go it alone. In icons featuring the transfiguration of Christ, one of which I've included in the manuscript that's of the sermon in the narthex and we'll put on the website tomorrow, but the icon of the transfiguration centers on the person of Christ in radiant glory with Moses and Elijah on either side representing the law and the prophets that we claim as Christians are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And then at Jesus' feet are the three disciples. They have fallen to the ground in worship and their shoes are off, cast aside. But if we go back even to the earliest forms of icons of the Transfiguration, traditional ones, two more scenes are often depicted on the left and the right of the icon. To the far left, Jesus is leading the three disciples up the mountain. And on the far right, the disciples are leading Jesus down the mountain. The implication is clear. Having experienced the transfiguring moment when the portals open wide between heaven and earth and the glory of God effuses the scene and lights on our face, we are changed for a purpose. We descend the mountain to present Christ's mercy and peace and love to a world in desperate need of such divine gifts. And then the second implication as Christ descends with us is that we need not think the transfiguring presence of God occurs only on mountaintops. Earth's crammed with heaven, each common bush afire with God. But seeing the glory of God in your midst will not inoculate you from the vagaries of life lived in the valley. It may help you see the world differently, recognizing it as a radiant setting for holy possibilities, even when you least expect it. Holy possibilities in which you are the bearer of God's glory and good news, sharing the sublime word that God is present with us in this world. And God is speaking beloved words to us all. So friends, 
Look for the burning bushes this week and take off your shoes. Let your face light up with transfiguring beauty as a child of God and declare to all that God is good and merciful and steadfastly in love with this world, with you and with me and all creation. Amen. Let us join with Christians throughout the world as we say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of God. Pray to God, who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, and whose glory presents as burning bushes in the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That the church may be continually uplifted by the vision of the transfigured Jesus in all his beauty, be rescued from all fear, and in confidence face the future. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our that the church may be conformed to Christ the Son of God, share in his sufferings, become like him in his death, and know the power of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our that your people may hear the prophet's testimony, see you clearly in the records of those who were eyewitnesses of your majesty, and do your will, preparing for your glorious coming on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. That the nations of the earth may more and more perfect the rule of law and administer justice after the examples of Moses, the lawgiver, and Jesus, bearer of the new covenant. Lord, in your mercy. That the church may heed the call of God in Christ Jesus to descend from the heights of vision to serve those who are needy, desolate, and forgotten. Lord, in your mercy. That the suffering, the lonely, the disconsolate, the dying, and those who mourn may know the transforming light of your presence. This morning we pray especially for Kip Lange, Maria Doe, Ginger Minot, Diane Stipp, Samuel, Adonai, Victor and Regina, Alicia, John, 
and those we now name. Lord, in your mercy, that those who bring us joy and make us grateful may strengthen us in our daily walk with you. This morning, we give thanks for the life of Donna Quigley, in whose memory the nave flowers are given, and for those blessings we now name. Lord, in your mercy, that those who have died may rest eternally in the light of Christ's radiant presence, especially Virginia Ginny Lodell Wright, Riley Marks, Bob Jackson, and those we now name. Lord, in your mercy. Arise, O morning star, and in your rising lift us to behold with all the saints the majestic glory of God, so that through the shadows and darkness of this world we may ever press toward the glory of the world to come, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. amen. I invite you to be seated and the vestry to come forward. Commissioning, we had commissioning at the 9 o'clock service with several uh, uh, vestry members there and several here today as well. Carrie Davis, Robert Stevens, Emily Meeks, uh, Barbara Erickson, who's our uh, vestry secretary, Michael Pereira, Roberta Canivy, and Clara Berg, and our wardens, senior warden Julia Logan, and junior warden for facilities, Walter Studeville, and junior warden for finance, Peter McClung. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body and given gifts for a variety of ministries for the common good. The ministry of governance for this cathedral is exercised by your vestry, which is entrusted with the overall stewardship and guidance of our mission and ministry. Our purpose today is to commission the members of the vestry for the ministry of servanthood and leadership to which they have been called. Are these persons you present prepared by a commitment to Christ as Lord, by regular attendance at worship, and by the knowledge of their duties to exercise their ministry to the honor of God and the well-being of God's people? I believe they are. To all of you gathered here as vestry, you have been elected to serve as cathedral congregation in our diocesan community with through the ministry of vestry. Will you, as long as you are engaged in this work, perform it faithfully, prayerfully, and diligently? I will. I invite the congregation to please stand. I have a question for you, and if you are inclined to answer in the affirmative, it would be, we will. Will you, who witness these promises, do all in your power to support these persons in their ministry? We will. Let us pray. 
O eternal God, the foundation of all wisdom and the source of all courage, enlighten with your grace the vestry of this congregation and so rule their minds and guide their counsels that in all things they may seek your glory and promote the mission of your church through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in the name of God and of this assembly, I commission you as members of the vestry of St. Mark's Cathedral Parish. Will you greet your vestry? The peace of the Lord be with you always. Good morning to you all once again. A delight to see you here and a word of welcome to those of you who may be visiting St. Mark's Cathedral this morning. If you're so inclined, if you would consider completing one of the visitor cards that's in the pew rack in front of you, or if you're in one of the chairs in the main aisles, it's in the front of your hymnal. Fill it out and drop it in the offertory plate here in a few moments so we'll know best how to serve you. I hope you'll stay on for some coffee uh, uh, following the service in the back corner of the nave. And let me also just hit a few highlights of upcoming events. Uh, after this service, uh, the um, Spirited Women's Group will meet over in Leffler House. It's described in your service leaflet uh, if you're a part of that group. Tuesday evening, beginning at 5.30, we will have our Mardi Gras celebration, Shrove Tuesday, here in the space with all sorts of decadent food and fun and festivities and fellowship. Come and be a part of that. We'll conclude the evening with the closing of the, um, of the cathedral gates uh, here on the uh, west wall as part of our turn into Ash Wednesday, which is the next day with a 7 a.m. service in the chapel and noonday and 7 p.m. services on Ash Wednesday here in the cathedral nave. The Midi's Focus Ministry begins its film series this Friday night with a film that's described in your service leaflet. I commend that to you as well. And lastly, let me say, if you uh, underwrote one or more of the chairs that are now a part of our uh, cathedral uh, seating, and uh, we have those plaques now, and we'll have those installed this week. We appreciate your patience in that, but look for them by this time next week uh, as a part of that. We turn now to the liturgy of the table. Wherever you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome here and at God's table. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because of the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mark and Mary and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
the gifts of God for the people of God.
Today, Kathleen Nyhuis and Russ Campbell will be taking Holy Communion to Marge Anderson and Darlene and Joan Halverson. One body are we, for though many we share one bread and one cup. Go in peace during holy gifts for holy people. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The wisdom of God, the love of God, and the grace of God empower you to be Christ's hands and heart in the world in the name of the one holy trinity. Amen.